I'm Henry Widdowson, um, long retired from um, academic life, but still having an interest in applied linguistics. Well, I suppose it all began with the British Council when I was um, an English language officer in Dhaka, in what was then East Pakistan. Um, and um, I was um, required to discuss English language teaching with um, the people from the ministry and the inspectors and so on, and with teachers and teachers, colleges, teacher um, education courses and so on. And uh, but I had had no uh, no qualification to do so. So <laughs> there I was. Um, advising uh, teachers how to teach with absolutely, with no credibility, whatever. And so I persuaded the British Council to send me on a course, and I went to Edinburgh and got a diploma in applied linguistics, and then I returned to East Pakistan um, and uh, then um, resumed my duties as English language officer, rather better informed than I was when I first went. Well, I wouldn't necessarily advise everybody to join the British Council, uh, or indeed to go to um, Bangladesh. Um, but I think it, for me, was very important that um, I should have had an experience of local conditions, so to speak, uh, of where the reality of English teaching actually is. Um, and that, for me, has always been a point of reference for any of the subsequent um, work that I did when I, I became an academic uh, and, um, and uh, joined the, uh, the Department of uh, Linguistics at the University of Edinburgh. Um, and what was, I think, of particular interest was that when I was in uh, East Pakistan, as it then was, Bangladesh, um, we were most concerned with uh, the teaching of English at technical institutes. Um, and it became clear that the English that had been taught uh, at the secondary level simply did not prepare um, students for working with English in the technical schools. And so this, is, this began what is now, what then became English for academic purposes. And uh, the reason I went back to Edinburgh was that it, was, it seemed to me important that um, one should do proper, well-thought-out research on the nature of linguistic communication as it related to these um, technical um, purposes. Um, and so that was the basis of my research. Um, so that my experience uh, in Bangladesh was the basis for me going to take this further into research into the university, so the applied linguistics was very much derived from practical experience. Then I was, I had just, when Baal was founded, I had, I was still in Bangladesh. And um, when I returned, um, uh, two years after that, uh, Baal was founded. And I joined Edinburgh, and so I, uh, of course, got to know Pitt Corder, who was in fact my supervisor doing my PhD. And so I was quite closely associated with, with, with Baal, in a sense, even before Baal, Baal was founded, because, uh, um, because I'd already been working with Pitt Corder, who then became the first chairman of Baal, of course. It's not for me to say what my contribution was. What I, I, can, I, can, I can tell you what I tried to do, what I hoped my contribution would be, and that is to... Um, to tr and again, it dates back, I suppose, to the Bangladesh experience. To try and to try and clarify uh, and explore um, basic assumptions that are made, uh, taken for granted beliefs as to what uh, language teaching is all about or what language is all about, um, because it was clear that the taken for granted assumptions uh, were open to question, and so I suppose that what I've always tried to do is to um, subject taken for granted ideas and assumptions to a critical appraisal and that's I've done this by and, and this by this notorious way I have of um, 
dichotomize it. When I talk about use and usage, text and discourse, cohesion, coherence, and I have a number of these conceptual distinctions. And it's not that I think that these are clear cut, but I think that they are a way in which one can explore uh, notions which seem to be taken for granted. So that if you've got the notion of performance, for example, as if that, that is one unitary phenomenon, if you look at it, you realize that this hides two really totally different uh, uses of language, or two different, mani one a manifestation of language as uh, usage, and then a, a communicative use of language, which is very different. But the term performance disguises this, for me, conceptual, es essential conceptual difference. And the same with text and discourse. I mean, these are, I think, required conceptual distinctions that one has to make. So I suppose that, if anything, that I've maybe uh, suggested that one should explore what has been sort of taken for granted or established uh, concepts, if you like. That sometimes I wonder whether the kind of thing that I have been doing has had any, or any very significant impact at all. Um, and uh, I think this is probably generally true of work in applied linguistics anyway that it tends to be confined to rather a small group of people uh, and how far it actually has an impact on most of the situations where English teaching is taught, I think is open to doubt. We tend, it tends to be a sort of self-generating uh, activity which in some sense has its own justification and I'm not so I, and the same would apply to my work, I think. I mean, I think it's intellectually been, for me, intellectually stimulating. And I think for some people it's still intellectually stimulating and significant. But I sometimes wonder whether, in fact, it... Uh, certainly now, I mean, I think most people uh, don't regard it as relevant to what they're doing. I don't, I don't really think that my work has had very much of an impact on what actually goes on in classrooms. I think that it might have led some people to think about what they are, what they are doing. And, but um, um, I, um, you see, I don't, I don't, I don't, I think that it, in a way, um, one has thought of applied linguistics too much as being a discipline. Um, and what I've tried to do is to make it an area of intellectual inquiry without committing it to the notion of a discipline. Right? Um, so that my hope has always been, and as I say, I'm not sure at all that this hope has ever been realized in any significant way, but my hope has always been that, that teachers could inquire into their own practices. That um, all teaching is in some sense theoretical. Every teacher has some idea about what language is and what learning is and so on. And I think myself that it's very important that this, these, these feelings which, are, which tend to be um, uh, un, 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 unexpressed, right? that these should be made explicit and subjected to conceptual analysis, if you like. And I think that would make language teaching more effective. If, if the teachers are more aware of what it is actually that they're doing, whether this has actually happened with any because of anything that I've written is another question. I'm not sure at all about that. The book that I suppose is the most comprehensive discussion of the kind of issues we've now been discussing uh, would be um, uh, defining issues in English language teaching, um, published by Oxford University Press. However, I mean you won't find it or any, any, any other of my books on the, the exhibition stand of the Oxford University Press. Uh, because, I don't know, because I think there's been a judgment that these are no longer significant. So if they are right, then there's really not much point in, in any t teachers reading my books uh, because apparently they don't have relevance to what they're doing. But if, by chance, there are teachers who would be interested in looking at the kind of issues we've been discussing and the kind of issues that I think are absolutely crucial for, for any kind of language teaching, not just English, 
then I think that is probably the book that I would suggest they might like to read. After they've read that book, uh, they could send me an email to tell me that they disagree, or that maybe even that uh, there's something there that they feel they can pursue. Um, but I can't think of anything specific that they, they should do uh, after that, except continuing to think critically about what it is that they actually do. Because until uh, there is this um, critical self-appraisal of the, of the ideas of which they take for granted, uh, which, which uh, um, their teaching is based, um, then I don't think they can claim to have a professional status. I mean, the professional status of a teacher goes with an awareness um, of the, what I would call, the theoretical basis of what they do. I think it's always unwise to ask older people to give advice to younger people. Uh, I know that it's traditional to do so, but in my experience, it's probably better for the younger people to give advice to the older ones. Um, and one of the, one of the sat most satisfying things about retirement um, is that if you still keep in touch with your younger colleagues, you continue to learn from them. And it becomes a kind of um, reversal, whereby, whereas previously, um, you were the one, so to speak, that was the authority and was sp spoke with a certain authority, um, you begin to realize that your research students, for example, know the subject better than you do and are able to think more clearly about it. And so you, you begin to learn from your students. And uh, I think this is true actually in families as well. I mean, there comes a point when, when the father um, loses, gradually loses authority, so to speak, and it's the children that then begin to take, take, as it were, take over the initiative. And so, as it so it is with teaching, um, at, the, at the university, I mean, and so it is generally with applied linguistics. I mean, you you preside over your own your own decline, and that is, I think, just as it should be.